with regard to cross-validation and exploiting the scientific method, why don't we get to that quickly and then we'll wrap up for today. Okay. So you mm -hmm. said that in one of your talks, we can use cross-validation to exploit the scientific method. First, what is cross-validation? You have to explain that to the audience. And then how does it undermine okay. science? Yeah, um, it's actually, I'm not sure what the exact quote was, but basically cross-validation is the scientific method formalized. So one aspect of the form of the scientific method, like so many um, glib phrases, it's glib and it leaves a lot out. Um, the scientific method, we don't, we put far more um, posterior probability. We assign far more credence in a theory if it predicts phenomena that we have not already observed and then are found to be true. So, you know, famously, for example, the, um, uh, Edding, who was it, was it Eddington and um, Einstein, the observ observation of during the eclipse and so on and so forth. Um, so another way to say that is that if I give you two theories, A and B, and I ask both of them to make a prediction about something that, that neither of them has then yet seen, um, and A predicts it accurately and B does not, then we say, let's go with A on making any subsequent predictions um, going over and above. And so that it can be viewed as part of the scientific method. Um, now, let's see what that might mean in the context of machine learning. Well, if I want to choose among a bunch of machine learning algorithms, one way to do it is to um, give them all a bunch of data and hold out some data, let them train on the data they have, and then just see which one does best on the data it doesn't have. And this is actually done in contests, bake-offs they're sometimes called all the time. You know, um, we're gonna choose between the following character recognition algorithms by giving them all of this data set, holding out some other examples and then seeing who does best. Um, you can also though do that yourself so to speak, by say, I've got myself, I've got a bunch of different algorithms that I can use. I've got a fixed data set. Let me play like I'm holding a bake off, train all these algorithms a part of my data set on part of my data set, see which one does best on my held out data. Take that one, now train on everything and use it to make my subsequent predictions and use that as to choose among different algorithms, just me, myself, as a solo machine learner, or, or to set parameters of a single algorithm. That, what I've just described to you, is what's called cross-validation. It is, it is part and parcel of machine learning algorithms. It is part and parcel of the scientific method. It does not get around the no free lunch theorems. That, in point of fact, you can actually show, and this is some really strange stuff that we'll that I would be very happy to talk about, but it will require some care in the discussion, that the algorithm of, of anti-cross-validation, of choosing the scientific theory that does worst at predicting, there are just as many priors for which that is going to outperform the scientific method as the other way around. So very strange. It almost makes no sense when I just say it that way. So what would be an example of a statement that we believe is scientifically true, but you believe it was founded by inadvertently exploiting something? Everything in science. Whenever I cross the street, everything. This is what I meant by why the, the Nofi Lunch Theorem is sometimes just my notes to myself, TP. Everything. Yeah. Um, uh, the anti-reasoning by no free lunch, anti-reasoning rather than reasoning in terms of inductive reasoning. Let me state what cross-validation is one more time simply to the audience so that some of the people who weren't able to follow can follow. Cross-validation, mm -hmm. if you've heard on a previous podcast, I believe I talked about Kripkenstein, there's a rule-following paradox. So it's similar to this. Imagine you have a kid, a child, you're teaching how do you add digits. So you have a, a set of a thousand cards and each of them is an arithmetical an arithmetic statement, a statement about arithmetic. So two plus five is seven, three to the power of four is, is, is 81. And then you show the child the set of statements that are correct and you show them the set of statements that are incorrect. So some of these are two plus five equals minus one. And then you say, and then you want to find out is the child following a rule, but the child could have simply, if you give them the whole deck, the child could simply 
memorize all of these cards. And you can show them a card, two plus three equals five. And you can say, is this correct? And they'll be like, that's correct. And then you don't know, are they following the rules of arithmetic or have they simply fit the data? So one way you can get around that is you take, let's say 70% of your cards and you say, learn some rule, child. I'm not even gonna tell you what the rule is. That's the point. I want you to learn, figure out how to add by looking at these examples. And I'm saving 30% of these here so I can show you new cards and say, is this one correct or incorrect? And then judging by that, I can say whether or not you're following the rules correctly. Okay, so that's what cross-validation is. Now, how does that undermine science? So that's essentially the scientific enterprises you've outlined it. Now, how do, so how does the no free lunch theorem relate to that? Say it one more time, please. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is, well, I could come up, I, the child can come up with any rule and it would still be, I could still find some situations in which that rule is valid just as many and in fact you could have whatever the child says you could i could define a new algorithm which is take whatever the child says and go with the opposite so to speak and there are going to be as many priors as many universes if we're talking about the scientific method in which that anti-algorithm is actually going to um, end up doing best on yet unseen situations rather than the original one. And it becomes very, very pointed when it's things like, um, it, it means that, for example, there are gonna be as many situations in which your algorithm does worse than random guessing as in which it does better, no matter what your algorithm is. Now, this implies to me that the scientific method should not work, yet it seems to. So why? The so problem. Work. Yep. The problem. TP. Because of your very statement, it seems to, is based upon the data set that has worked so far. But then when we go to off train, the no free lunch says doesn't mean the fact that it's worked so far well in the past has anything to say about how well it will work in the future. It's just like evolution has worked so well in the past, has no implications about how well it will work in the future. So it eats its own tail. Interesting. The fact that anything that, that, that we have used go up to a meta level, a meta algorithm of some sort, where I'm choosing between strategies for choosing between strategies, doesn't matter. Um, in fact, there's a um, philosopher, Carl Schurz, who um, just came out with a book on meta induction. It's making a big um, splash or waves, you know, whatever the um, sure. I guess aquatic metaphor of choice. And um, he's got a whole chapter on no free lunch. And I actually just wrote a commentary um, on that. There were some that were solicited and it's going to be appearing in um, the uh, Journal of General Philosophy of Science or something like that. I forget the precise name where he claims that his results um, get around no free lunch, but, no, they don't. Um, he's talking about meta induction at this level. So you're doing induction about induction about induction to try to essentially um, break the uh, Gordian, you know, break free your binders. But they don't break free the binders. You're still stuck. And we have no reason to believe the scientific method. But I sure as hell believe it. Listen to the earlier part of this podcast mm -hmm. where I was going whole hog. I was the most dyed in the wool um conservative dogmatic scientific reasoner you could come up with and then the next breath i'll tell you that it's got no legitimacy by the way would you consider math to be scientific or do you consider science to be separate from math oh um this is like what you asked me before about being an artist versus and so on and so forth um i don't um i don't make those kinds of distinctions i will yeah the reason i was asking is if you did consider it then it would be as if what you're saying is by using science i've undermined science that is by, by using, using math which is a subset of which which is a subset of science girdle by using math undermined math yep well girdle undermined a part of math whereas you're undermining the entire scientific enterprise yep pushing it further pushing it further and then things like the inference devices work go even further. They, um, in some senses, undermine the notion of um, epistemology, full stop, of even knowing something, no matter how that information is arrived at, even by luck. 
and this gets to another very, very much tongue in cheek definition of free will, um, which was very, very much tongue in cheek. Um, and then the stuff on noisy deductive reasoning would say that, oh, but if uh, math itself, including that reasoning that you're using to come to these other theorems is itself a noisy process inherently. It, it's, it's, not, it's not turtles all the way down, it's um, uh, straw men all the way down or something mm. like 